preaching and teaching this morning. There is such important and amazing ways and works that God is doing, and I am uh, certainly excited to see and to imagine how the Word of God can be for us, a lamp unto our feet. If you need a Bible, shoot your hand in the air. Someone can certainly bring a Bible to you. We will have our words of Scripture uh, on the screen, so if uh, you want to pay attention there in that way, that'd be great as well. Uh, I hope and I am excited about all that God will do. Pray for us. Amen. We have a little technical difficulties. We got to get some electrical stuff done, and hopefully that'll happen in the next few weeks. Uh, we have so much happening. It's just got me so nervous. Amen. I'm like, Lord Jesus, let me hurry up and preach for the thing. Shut off. So y'all may get a nice quick sermon today. Amen. Amen. Y'all sound happy about that. We're heading to Luke chapter number 19. Amen. Luke chapter 19. That's where we're headed. Amen. Luke chapter number 19. We're continuing this uh, sermon series, uh, exploring not only the voice of God, uh, but we're talking about what we are calling the sunken church syndrome. And uh, many of you know, if you were here last week, that uh, it was a uh, a little bit of a play off this new movie that's been out called Get Out. How many of y'all saw seen Get Out? Know a little bit about this film, Amen. So it is uh, uh, a little bit of a backdrop that you know I thought would be a really important cultural marker, perhaps, uh, so you and I can uh, maybe be reminded whenever we are being told to get out that there's a little bit more things need to get out besides us just getting out. Touch your neighbor, somebody, Amen, Amen. And certainly on this uh, Sunday, we know. And we expect and we uh, anticipate next Sunday. Uh, we're excited because uh, I certainly believe that Jesus got up so you can get out as well. And so we'll uh, spend a little time talking about that. But certainly on today, I want to talk a little bit about uh, recovering your voice and recovering our voice. And what does it mean for our voices uh, to not be lost uh, in all of the things that are happening that would cause us to find ourselves in a place of despair, a place of paralysis. And so let's take a look at the Word of God. Amen. Luke chapter number 19. Uh, we now see Jesus about a week away from his crucifixion. And Jesus is well aware that there are some folk who don't mean him good. And even though Jesus has come to save the whole world, uh, that there are some folks who are going to benefit from the salvation of Jesus who are not actually interested in appreciating the work of salvation that Jesus will perform. I don't know about you, but it's always a good reminder to, uh, to, to just keep at the front of your mind that people may not always appreciate the works that you will do that will actually be a blessing in their life. But sometimes your purpose has to override people's appreciation. Amen. Amen. You can't always do things hoping that folks are going to fully understand the extent of your actions. But I believe that when you do things that are in line with your purpose, uh, just keep hanging around a little while. Amen. God will bring everybody back to you and they'll have to say, surely, amen, you was doing something that uh, God got the glory out of and I benefited from. And uh, I just want to say thank you. Amen. Amen. And I think this is a great example of what we see happening, particularly in this passage. Jesus has just got done doing all of his uh, regular acts of healing and encouragement and feeding. Jesus was helping folks in many respects to come out of their sunken places, come out of their places of despair and isolation and hopelessness. And uh, Jesus saw uh, a real quick appreciation, but he also saw a quick turnaround of folks uh, starting to acknowledge that he's more of a threat to the status quo than they had ever imagined. And uh, how many know disruption is not always a pleasant feeling, even for those who are oppressed? Amen. Some of us can get used to our oppression and, and, and kind of, you know, the devil we know is better than the devil we don't know. Amen. Anybody ever heard that before? Amen. And so it, we could resist some of our efforts to be set free. But I believe today's sermon 
may give you and I some skills and some tools or at least some markers to understand what must we do to reclaim and to amplify and dare I say to boldly recover our voice. We're going to read a little bit today because this passage I think is uh, worthy of our attention on this Palm Sunday. So turn with us uh, to Luke chapter number 19 verse number 29. When you have it say I got it. All right. Uh, let's read and let's see how Luke is uh, chronicling uh, this entrance into the final week of Jesus' life, if you will, certainly the holy week that we will celebrate. The Word of God in verse 29 says, And when Jesus had come near Bethphage and Bethany, at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Amen. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. All right. Amen. Now, you got to appreciate that a colt and a donkey during that time uh, was not uh, something of small consequence. It would kind of be like uh, 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 Jesus seeing a car with some keys in it at the valet and uh, is ready for someone to take it. And Jesus be like, let's see here. I got to take a trip. You know, he's with his posse and whatnot. And he's just like, I got to take a trip. Oh, look at that car. That car fit us all. Come on, I need that car. And, uh, and uh, they're like, Jesus. <laughs> People get killed for taking folks' cars. You know, Jesus is like, don't worry, I'm going down anyway. No, I'm just playing. No, 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 G Jesus, <laughs> Jesus sees, the, sees the, the, the colt and the donkey, and he, and he says, I need that. And they say, well, Jesus, I, I mean, you know, he wants to go carjack these people. I don't know what he wants to do. Jesus says, just tell them if they ask you why. And, of course, someone is going to ask them, why are you taking my stuff, right? Jesus says, tell them the Lord has need of it. just want to help, you know, contextualize this passage because we can read things and not understand uh, the, the kind of, uh, uh, radical things Jesus was asking his disciples to do. Amen. And it's important for you and I to appreciate that if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to be asked to do some radical things. Things that are going to be countercultural. Things that are going to require you to have to scratch your head and be like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Am I hearing this right? This can't be right. The Lord needs it. Just park that in your brain real quick. Verse number 32. So those who were sent departed and found the colt, the donkey, the whole situation, as he told them. As they were untying the colt, his owners asked them, why are you untying this colt? Natural reaction. What you doing with my stuff, man? You know? And, and they said, the Lord needs it. And... There's a big gap there, so I don't know if they ran. I don't know if they, I don't know. But I thank God everything worked out all right. Not telling you to try that this week in Holy Week, but just want to help you to understand the radicality of what Jesus asked his disciples to do. Verse 35, then they brought the donkey, the colt, to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they sat Jesus on it. And Jesus rode along, and people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. And as he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, Order your disciples to stop. Jesus answered, I tell you, if they were silent, the stones would shout out. My goodness. I preach this another time. I would probably say, what would the stones say? Amen. But that ain't today. Amen. That's, 
Maybe I'll preach that on the road somewhere, somewhere else. Verse number 41, and Jesus came near and saw the city. Jesus wept over it, saying, if you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Lord, help us. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you, hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. Somebody holler, don't miss God, don't miss God, don't miss God. Then Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling things there. And he said, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of robbers. And every day Jesus was teaching in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, the leaders of the people kept looking for a way to kill Jesus. But they did not find anything they could do for all the people were spellbound by what they heard. This is the word of God. For us, the people of God, may we say thanks be to God. How can we get our voice back? How do we get our voices back? Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And as I stand and preach and teach your word, I pray that you will send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and even the hearers of this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. Pat yourself on the chest and say, God, give me my voice back. God, give me. How does one lose your voice? How does one lose their ability to articulate your highest purpose. What has to happen and what does happen in our lives, particularly we who are followers of Jesus and certainly as the community who follows Jesus, the church, what happens to us where our voices can become silenced? Silenced to the point where our voice cannot be distinguished from the voice of the dominant culture, certainly of the larger world. What happens to a church who has access to the words of God and certainly are attuned in our ears and our spirit and our heart to the voice of God that we can become so overtaken by our life's challenges and trials that we indeed lose our voice. I'm so struck by the many ways that trauma and fear, worry and pain silences the voice of God's people. That our voices can often become so co-opted by the challenges of our lives that rather than speaking the speech that has been given to us by God as a gift for our own liberation and the liberation of all who find themselves living under the weight and the burden of rebellion and sin against God, that our voice can eschew that which has been given to us and we can start reaching for the voices of others. But dear loved one, don't you know that when you and I stop speaking with the power and aligning our voices with the heart of God, you could be saying things and not be saying anything at all. Have you ever met someone who talks a lot but don't really say that much? I mean, it's like, man, that was a waste of oxygen. Amen. <laughs> Certainly was a waste of the dictionary. Amen. You, you know, and you may know some folk who talk a lot 
but their words don't produce healing. Their words are acts of destruction. And part of what I want to submit to you, loved ones, today is that God has called us in this moment and in this season to be a church that is always cognizant of the uniqueness of our voice in a world that is filled with all kinds of voices. That God wants you and I to be fully aware that if you cannot repeat what God says in a world that is countercultural to what God wants, your voice, even while you are talking as a follower of Jesus, can easily become silenced. And I'm so enamored by the ways in which the cultural markers in, in not only this film, but in other places, remind you and I of how you can be in such a vulnerable state. Because in the movie you saw, we saw that this young man who was visiting his girlfriend's family had not dealt with all of his trauma and his struggles and his issues. And there was somebody there waiting to manipulate him in his most vulnerable moment. And, you know, the mother put a little spell on him and had him so messed up that the great image is he was falling down a pit in a free fall. It looked like he was speaking and yelling and hollering, but nothing was coming out of his mouth. And I don't know about you, but as I was watching that, I thought of all the many times I've been in a free fall. Because my trauma and my vulnerability, my inability to be reminded of what God is doing in my life and our lives, it robbed me of my ability to repeat the promises and the, 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 the declarations of God, not only in a public manner, but even in a private manner, that I found it most difficult to speak to God because I thought that maybe God's not listening at all. And don't you know, for many of us, we are living in a season where there's so much trouble in the world that there are more people who are questioning if God is real. Even in the building today, I, it is not lost on me that there is a season of great doubt and anxiety about, God, what are you up to? I mean, how long must I pray before my family smooths on out? How often must we cry out in the streets for justice only to see the exact reverse being declared by an attorney general and a president and a Homeland Security Chief, that God, we've been doing this struggle not just since Michael Brown or Trayvon Martin or Sandra Bland or Oscar Grant, but for generations we've been crying out for help. And just when some of us thought we were getting some momentum, now we have a hard stop. God, I, 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 I went through hell and high water. Thought the worst was behind me in this relationship. I thought my community was finally starting to come around. And all of a sudden, I'm still trying to make sense of the death of these children. Gun violence, the missing of these girls. The bombs being dropped in Syria and in Egypt, and it's so fascinating because for many of us, we will get very and rightly upset about the bombing that happened this morning in Egypt by so-called ISIS, who is saying they are taking credit for the bombing. But all across this country, folks will celebrate the bombs we dropped in Syria. 
with an acknowledgement that it was our tax dollars that, that sustained and made a way for that bombing to happen. Or we would say, well, you know, just because it was Donald Trump, I'm worried about it. But when it was another president that I liked. I mean, it's tantamount to saying, well, you know, because, you know, I grew up in, in Hunter's Point kind of, kind of, you know, flavor. So, you know, people ask me where I'm from. I was like, I'm from HP. This is Hunter's Point's little hood over in San Francisco. Amen. And then, you know, there are folk from Sunnydale. We called it the swamp, amen, because it was, you know, swampy. It was... Or Fillmore, or Lakeview. We had all our little sets kind of like West Berkeley and South Berkeley and North Oakland and East Oakland. And, 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 and you, you had the Crescent. I mean, you everybody had their little neighborhoods. And it was like you would be outraged when the violence hit close to home to you. But when... You are the source of violence or trauma or injustice or oppression. We always seem to got a good reason <laughs> why we are agents of such destruction in the world. We lose our voice when we stop struggling with the fact that we can be both the oppressor and the oppressed at the same time. When we think that our actions are free from criticism from the ways of Jesus. Our voice has been lost and co-opted by, dare I say, our own voice in our head. Because how many of you know we think we're a lot smarter than we really are? The way that God tells us this in Scripture, he says that there is a way that seems right unto us. But the end is destruction. How many of you know when your voice begins to drown out the voice of God, destruction is the path that we are on. And that is why I love this text today, because Jesus shows us that there is a path that he is on. As we enter into Holy Week, and Jesus is inviting you and I to participate in his journey towards the cross. Now, be clear. The cross is not a destination with a waiting list. Touch your neighbor, somebody. Amen. Everybody want to go to heaven, they say. But don't nobody want to die. Mm-hmm. Truth be told, if I can skip death, I'd be cool. You know, in our Christian faith, we believe that Jesus is coming back. I hope you still believe that. Amen. I certainly do. Jesus is coming back. And you better get right or you're going to get left. Ain't that what they say? <laughs> Give your neighbor a high five and tell them get right or get left. I don't mean no harm. I don't mean no harm. Jesus coming back. Jesus is 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 making a clear pathway for you and I to understand that when Jesus comes back, most folk like you know, I just want to be raptured. I don't want to have to you know suffer and die. You know, Lord, just just rapture me, just. That's how I want my entrance into heaven to be. Hello, somebody. You know that's the truth. For all of us who claim to follow Jesus and we got, you know, the old song we sing, I got shoes, you got shoes, all God's children got shoes. We gonna get our shoes on the other side. We don't get our shoes now. Ain't it interesting that all of us, no matter how many shoes you got now or don't have, when you get close to your uh, 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 perceived death, we will spend every dime we have to stay alive, to hold on to them shoes you got, them possessions. I'm not hating on it, but I'm just trying to lift up this point that even for the child of God, for many of us, fear of death will co-opt our voice, will silence our voice. Where? 
For you and I, if we are following the resurrected Christ, death should not have any power over us. Meaning that I don't live my life by fear of loss. But I live my life on purpose. Because I trust and believe and I know that God's work and will in and through us. This path that Jesus is inviting us on. It is a path. It is a test. It is an opportunity for you and I to gauge our availability. Now, how many of you know this day, Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, is a good test of our availability? Because in this this text, we already talked a little bit about it. Jesus is inviting his disciples to participate in his journey to the cross. And the way Jesus is inviting them to participate is probably not the way that they had imagined. Jesus says, go and get this donkey, this colt. They're like, Jesus, man, that's a hard ask. But isn't it interesting that the owner and the donkey were ready and available to Jesus? Which makes me ask, want to ask all of us the question, how available are we to Jesus being the one who will ride our pleasures, our pains, our doubts, our fears, our anger? Ride on that. Are we available for God in this season? God says, I have need of you. And you're like, well, God, I got this to do. And I have this struggle. And I have this problem and this unanswered question. I'm too filled with anger about the death of my loved ones. Too filled with anxiety. Too filled with hurt. And I hear God saying and maybe speaking to us in a powerful way that if you are not available for God, to ride in your life. And who are you let riding? I mean, you know, it's kind of like, don't everybody get to fit in the car you got? I don't know if you've ever been giving some folk a ride, and you're like, okay, yeah, I'll be there to pick you up in a few minutes. And you're like, they're like, cool, cool, you get there, and they got 10 people. And you're sitting there like, man, I thought I was giving you a ride. Oh, yeah, but they need a ride, and they need a ride, they need a ride, they need a ride. It's like, well, all y'all can't fit. You know, if these folks was really your partners, right, they'd be like, well, I'm not going to I'm not gonna take a ride if all my people can't come. How many of you ever met folks to be like, okay, y'all, well, I'm sorry. You know, I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Got to go. Peace. Hope that worked out for you. My larger point, though, is that how many know you can't take everything with you on the journey with God? And I want to I want to I want to be very clear with you, dear loved ones, that God has need of us in this season. In this season where war, and violence, depression Stress, violations, abuse, all these things happening in the world. God is in need of a church who will not be in a sunken place, a place where your voice is silenced and co-opted because of the real conditions that everybody faces every day. God wants us to be folk who are able to at least be attuned to win Jesus shows up and says, I have need of you. And we can say, God, I'm available. I'm available to what you would do in my life. And I want to submit to you that our availability to accept God's invitation is the key to our path and recovery. I was speaking this weekend somewhere and I said, Our liberation is directly connected to the number of conversions we're willing to have. 
Because how many know God's got to change a lot of our minds many times over in order for us to get further down the road than where we are today? I mean, I thank God for all you that God just had to change your mind one time and everything was just like cool. But how many of you know every day I wake up, wake up, God is doing a conversion thing on me. God is converting us to reject the ways of this world. God is converting us to, to dismantling the, 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 the exclusionary forms of living that, you know, we bring some close to us and hold others at an arm's length. You may be in prison and folk will assign a value to your life knowing that, you know, you just didn't get caught. Anybody ever, anybody ever you know, did some dirt and you didn't get caught? Don't you hate it when, you know, just because you didn't get caught, you a little more self-righteous than the one who got caught? Like you forgot that we was there together. <laughs> we robbed that store together. Now all of a sudden you, you like, man, you know, you know, I don't, man, I don't know what he was th- thinking about. It's like, man, you was right there with me, bro. I remember when we was growing up, we, you know, used to run with some guys that would steal cars. And, you know, a few times, you know, you hopping in and out the car, one of the guys get caught. And, and you know, next time we see him, we're like, man, why you didn't run faster? <laughs> like, man, I was trying to run as fast as I could, but what slowed the cops down was when they tackled me and y'all kept going. <laughs> you didn't come back to see about me. Don't get so self-righteous, loved ones. There is no situation that others are going through that you will not have to cross that path eventually. And so you and I must be available to be converted over and 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 over over again. And when you put a Limit a cap on how many times God is going to convert your heart and your mind and your soul. That may be the description of how your bondage will stay intact. I don't know about you, but I'm always asking God, change my mind. Change my heart. Give me something new and something different. So my voice, my way of living, my, my, my sensibility does not get co-opted and hijacked and silenced when God would want it to be amplified and proclaimed everywhere. Give your neighbor a high five and tell him you got to get your voice back. You got to get your voice back. You got to get your voice back. Because if you don't have, keep, amplify, sustain your voice, that is a reflection of God's voice then you are in actuality robbing some folk around you of the opportunity to be blessed by the inherent liberatory voices that God has placed inside of us. And I want you to know, loved ones, that if God has brought you out of anything, your voice has the power to help be a path for someone else to come out as well. How do you get your voice back? The first thing that I believe that you and I must be willing to do to regain our voice, to recover our voice, is to be people committed to a life of prayer. Somebody holler pray. Now this seems very rudimentary for a follower of Jesus, for church folk. We should pray. But how many of you know, even though we know we should pray, we don't pray? I wish I had honest church in here today. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying it as a condemnatory thing. I just know we don't pray because I look at how we act. I need to pray more because there's some folk in situations that help me see. Me, bright, you're not praying enough. Because my response to you is a <laughs> not a prayerful response. Touch your neighbor, somebody. 
I'm so captivated by Jesus as he came near and saw the city. He wept over it and he began to say, he began to pray. He began to put these words together to intercede on behalf of the city. A few things that I think prayer will do to help you recover your voice. Number one, it will help you be in line with the heart of God. When you pray regularly, your heart becomes in line with God's. Your words begin to get aligned with God. And when your words and your heart are aligned with God, you will weep over what God weeps for. I can imagine that there's some folk walking through Jerusalem and they're like, man, this city is toe up. What's wrong with these folk in Jerusalem? The reason why Jerusalem is under oppression by the Roman government is because Jerusalem is just unfaithful. You know, folks always got an analysis about why certain people's situations or circumstances are a certain way. And rather than having compassion, they offer judgment. That's how you know you're not praying. That's how you know your voice has been co-opted by somebody else. Because if God won't judge you with a condemnation, why? with God's people. It's because we're not praying enough. Think about it. Jesus walking into Jerusalem and his first reaction is to weep. Is to feel sorrowful. Is to have compassion. And then he goes on to describe why. Because you don't know how to make peace. You don't recognize that God is present. That didn't bring anger from Jesus, it caused Jesus to weep. When you pray regularly, I believe that our reaction to the worst conditions in our world, dare I say in your family, dare I say in your own life, will be less and less about anger and violence and retribution. But it will be an act of Responding the way God would. Prayer helps me to reach for healing and not destruction. Prayer helps me to reach for forgiveness and not retribution. Prayer helps me to become more humble and not be all haughty with my own pride and ego. Prayer helps you to recover your voice. The unique voice of God's people in a world that has become overrun with the voice of Satan. The voice of evil. The voice of strength through domination. Ain't it something that God is all powerful, but God don't try to dominate you and me? <laughs> Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that thing, boy. You know, I'm glad God don't be trying to, like, force God's self on me like that. God be like, whosoever will, let him come. Thank you, Jesus. And then I keep giving you time and time again, chance and chance again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. He just don't be banging me upside the head. Say yes, McBride. No. Say yes, McBride. No. God don't work like that. We just walk around, you know, with a, with a you know, short neck, broken wheel. But how many of you know that God continues to respond to us with compassion, with healing, with opportunity? I believe that one of our greatest challenges in this season and in this moment is can we pray as much as we complain? God, help me to pray as much as I put words of negativity in my situation. I'm not saying you can't complain because it's human to just complain. But you better pray as much. If you complain in a lot, you better pray a lot. Don't you dare complain a lot and pray a little. Don't you dare complain a little and don't pray at all. At least match your prayer with your complaining. I wish I could talk to somebody in here today. And make sure as you're praying that your actions are matching your prayers. Because God is not a genie. You get to rub that thing and get three wishes. Click your heels and just wish upon a star. 
Uh, I love this quote by, I think it was Augustine or Athanasius. He says, pray as if everything depended on God and work as if it all depended on you. Prayer and work. Our alignment with God requires a balance. And dear loved ones, if we're going to recover our voice, I think that we have to become more committed to prayer. And what better time to be more committed to prayer than entering into the season of Easter of Holy Week. God, every day I wake up this week, may I take time to seek your face. These next weeks following, may I make sure that my voice is lining up with your voice. Here's some questions for you to think about then. Uh, The first question, are you praying as much as you're complaining? What situations require your prayers for peace? Do your prayers reorient you to your true voice, the voice that is reflective of God's? Oh, my greatest... One of my greatest, and it'll feed into this next point of of prophesying, of being prophetic, is how you, you get your voice back. Somebody holler prophetic. Somebody say prophesy. One of the ways you get your voice back is you have to prophesy. You have to speak and say what God says. And one of my greatest concerns in this season, in this moment, is that the church, the follower of Jesus, our voice has become more familiar and it's becoming more, more, more aligned and alike with the voice of this world. And I'm not talking about, you know, you know, uh, the list of sins that you don't struggle with or you do struggle with. Uh, that's, that's a part of it. But I'm, I'm actually talking about the many ways in which we just fall right in. There is a certain kind of insidiousness about social sin that co-ops our voices and ha- causes us to affirm that which God is obviously against. God is not for wars. Well, there's war in the scripture. That's why Jesus came, y'all. Did you know that? Oh, no, Jesus came (laughs) because even God's people were so violent. God's people only understood that the way they could get to the promised land was to wipe out other nations. I want you to understand that God don't need you to fight God, God's battles like that. Don't you know the earth is the Lord's? Did you ever heard that scripture? If everything belongs to God, why you got to be the one to fight about it? Hello, somebody. God must be pretty powerless to need you to fight his battles. The problem with some of us is our God is too small. And because our God is so small in our own minds, we don't really trust and believe that God can take good care of God's people. Oh, McBride, that's such an altruistic, that's such an idealistic thing to say. Well, how's this war working out for us? Don't you know that our government is supplying weapons to both sides of the conflict? Your tax dollars, my tax dollars. Building walls and, and weapons for enemies in other countries. Not no, oh, I don't care about no other country. How about this? Your tax dollars and my tax dollars. Giving police departments weapons of war to use on us here. You recover your voice as a follower of Jesus when you learn to speak truth to the powers of this world. Jesus Going on his way to Calvary, had to stop through the temple, and he realized that there's some folk in this place that are abusing the purpose of my temple. Now, I want to take a step back here because I think the temple can be a two, a, a what, 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 what do I call that, a, 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 a two for one. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, Lord, what am I, where am I trying to say? A double entendre. Who said that? Come on, man. He, he listened to me when I preached. Obviously, he got that from me. <laughs> A double entendre that the temple, the church, has become a tool of supporting oppression. But how about your own personal temple? 
How is your own personal temple being sold in the courts of this capitalistic and racist and violent world? How is your own temple, your own body, your mind, your heart, your limbs being used as a tool of violence and oppression? Martin Luther King, this past week, we celebrated and remembered not only his death, but his speech about violence or about Vietnam, the war in Vietnam at Riverside. And, and we remembered how Dr. King was talking about the triplets of evil. Materialism, a.k.a. economic exploitation, capitalism. Militarism, the, that the greatest purveyor of violence in the world was the United States government. And racism are racial hierarchies where we demean the lives of some to help elevate the lives of others. How many of you know none of that can happen without the use of some of our bodies? And isn't it a sad commentary that you can come to church and follow Jesus and still be an agent of racism and sexism and violence and war and still believe that you are following Jesus faithfully? The devil is a lie. You can't do it all and say, I'm following Jesus faithfully. Now, I'm not saying Jesus is going to throw you away. You better be glad I'm not Jesus. You better be glad I'm not God. Because some of us wouldn't make it in ever. How we act. How we treat one another. But great is the mercy of God where God always gives us a chance to be more faithful. And how will you and I become more faithful? In this moment, can you recover a voice where you can speak the truth to the power of evil in the world and the power of evil in your own life? Can you be honest enough with yourself to say that I am a violent person? I am an angry person. I am a manipulating person. I got schemes for days in my mind about how to get around you, how to take advantage of you. Can we be honest enough? As we go to Calvary, as we know some things must die, if we're going to be faithful to the ways of Jesus to say, God, let the change be in me. If Jesus had to clean out the temple because folks in there selling and exploiting, ask yourself, Jesus, what must you clean inside of me? God, come in my life like gangbusters and tear down those strongholds that keep me from being who you've created me to be. Because, God, if you can change me, I think I'll show up in a situation that requires me to change the world. God, if you can help me become more faithful, I believe I'll show up in the world more faithfully. God, if you can help tear down some of those abusive and exploited practices in my own life, I believe I can tell the government, the mayor, Pookie and them, my school, whoever it is that God requires us to be just, to love mercy, to walk humbly in the world. Prophesy. You got to prophesy to yourself. You got to speak the truth to the powers of yourself, of this world. We have these forums here at The Way all across the country so people of faith can show up publicly and prophesy to the systems of this world. But we also have prayer meeting. We also have Bible studies. We also have personal disciplines. So you can show up every day and speak the truth of God's word to yourself. Don't become so outwardly focused that you neglect the inner transformation that God wants to do in our lives. Because if you don't pay attention to yourself, you will lose your voice. And you'll be responding always to the voices of others. You crying about the violence of the police, but you violent against your spouse. 
This brother shot his, 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 the mother of his children with her kids, their kids in the car. Now, I'm sure he probably looked at a police officer that killed somebody before and was like, man, that cop is just. But he could not see in his own self the violence that would take the life of his children's mother right in front of those kids. What kind of blind spots do we as people of God have? We can celebrate violence or condone violence or be an agent of violence on one ear, but can't allow that violence in our own lives to be checked. Jesus going down a path towards Calvary, realizing there's some opportunities that I want to give to some folk to be available. Let's take a hard look at the ways in which consistent communication and engagement with God can help you recover your voice. To be honest about the the places in our own lives and the, the larger culture that need to hear and have the voice of God injected. Oh, my prayer for us today is that we will recover our voice. That we won't be so seduced by the voices of this world, of your friends, of your partners, of your homies, of your boo, of whoever. If their voice does not align with the voice of God, Lord, help me to put a bracket around that voice. Help me to minimize that voice. Help me to pray that that voice becomes more in alignment with your voice but whatever that whatever happens Lord help me to recover the voice so I'm not in a free fall I'm not lost I'm not caught up in somebody else's project and forsaking the project of God in my life I love how the children of Israel We're constantly given opportunities to come back to God. It got so (laughs) cyclical that God just finally had to say through the prophet, I'm married to the backslider. Because obviously y'all can't get this thing right. That is, to me, a great comfort. That God is not condemnatory about our inability to be more faithful. God keeps inviting us into faithfulness. Lean in, dear loved ones, to recovering your voice. Don't stay in a place that is beneath your privilege. As God's children, you have access to the creator of the universe. The promises of this creator are yours. The gifts of this creator are yours. The purposes of this creator are yours. And it is our responsibility to show forth the praises of that one who brought us out of darkness into a marvelous light. Come on, stand with me. Stand up with us.